Hello, everybody. How are we doing today? Yeah, not a bad place to be. Uh, as Casey said, my name is Mike Chamberlain, and I work at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to share with you some really remarkable stories about some inventions that have been inspired by ocean animals. And while each of the inventions themselves are quite diverse, they all have one thing in common, which is that each of the inventors recognize a real basic but crucial thing about how life works out in nature. Whether you're talking about animals on the land or in the sea, it's the efficient designs that are going to survive over time. So by studying how these animals were successful in making a living out in the wild, they've borrowed some of the underpinnings of their adaptations that have allowed them to survive and thrive over the eons and apply them to some really remarkable new inventions. Now, certainly this idea that we could look to nature for inspiration to do new things is not a new one. Witness the number of people in the last century that looked to birds as an inspiration for how to achieve flight. And perhaps some of these that were better thought out than others, but they were on the right track by trying to emulate wings of birds as a means of a getting off the ground. This guy was probably looking at the wrong kind of bird. Think about a blue jay or a crow. They've got to constantly flap their wings to stay aloft. Uh, but Orville and Wilbur Wright, on the other hand, they focused on soaring birds, animals like eagles and hawks that can stay aloft for hours on end without even flapping their wings. So by studying how eagles are able to both achieve lift as well as to manage the wind once they're aloft, on December 17th, 1903, they became the first people to achieve flight. Now certainly, we could all take it for granted today that we can step on a plane in San Francisco and arrive in New York City five hours later or ship a package overnight to London, but those are really game-changing innovations that came on the heels of using nature as an inspiration for how to do things new and better. A great example of that same line of thinking in the modern age is the story of Dr. Frank Fish. And despite his last name, he's not a marine biologist, he's actually focused on uh, aerodynamics, and particularly Frank is interested in understanding what will make for an efficient wind turbine blade. Now, for the last 100 years or so, the dominant thinking about what makes for a good blade stipulates that you should make sure that the leading edge of that blade is smooth, has a front edge that is smooth, will give you the most maximum results. Well, given that fact, that's why Frank was rather struck when he was shopping for a gift for his wife in a small store outside of Boston and came across a bronze sculpture of a humpback whale. And he noticed that the sculptor had put bumps on the front flipper, and his first thought was, given the, his line of work, he sees that flipper looking a lot like a blade. That makes no sense. Why would the whale have bumps on the front of its flipper? But by the same token, he also knew that these animals were certainly capable of some pretty remarkable acrobatic feats that have allowed them to be successful hunters for millions of years. And so he got to thinking that perhaps the bumps were giving the whale some sort of advantage that he simply hadn't thought of. So he went back to his workshop, he got a hold of an image of a humpback whale's front flipper, and then he built a prototype or mock-up blade that emulated those bumps that he saw. He took that bumpy blade up to a test facility outside of Ontario, Canada, and he uh, mounted it up on some turbines to do a side-by-side -side comparison with some smooth edge blades as its counterpart. Lo and behold, the ones with the bumps resulted in a 20% increase in efficiency over their smooth edge counterparts. Now, 20% might not sound like a whole lot, but when you consider just how much more viable wind as a clean energy technology could be when you start seeing increases in efficiency like 20%, that's pretty good news. Uh, encouraging to think about the fact that, you know, this is one of the ways we could get alternative energies to be more prevalent. Right now, about 12 to 13% of our energy in this country comes from what we would consider renewable resources, but the vast majority, about 85%, is coming from burning stuff. And when we burn stuff to get the energy we need to power the modern world, that's causing carbon pollution. Now, I'm an aquarium guy, and why am I talking about this? About 40% of the emissions you see are being absorbed by our oceans. And what we're seeing right now is a change in the ocean's chemistry as a result of man's activities on land. The oceans are becoming more acidic, and that's making it a lot harder, causing big challenges for animals that have shells, because shells and acid don't mix. So when we hear about stories like the ones being uh, put forth by Frank Fish about ways to make it more viable to get the energy we need that in a cleaner fashion, we get pretty excited. So another story that's whale inspired, at least to start with, anyone recognize who's glued themselves to the whale? And this crowd's probably pretty easy, right? Barnacles, right? And barnacles, of course, love to affix themselves, in this case, to the gray whale because they get lots and lots of plankton when the gray whale makes that migration between Alaska and Mexico, 12,000 miles round trip, 
tremendous amounts of plankton being exposed. Uh, so not any harm being done to the whale per se, but it is causing a little bit of additional drag or resistance. And we see this phenomenon with quite a few of the larger, slower moving marine animals over the course of their long lives. They have this phenomenon that occurs called biofouling, basically marine gunk that affixes itself to the shell of or the body of these larger animals. So not a big deal for the turtle here, but it is slowing it down. It's a little bit bigger of a headache, though, if you own a boat. This is what a boat looks like after about a year's worth of neglect. The same phenomenon that we saw on the whale and the manatee is affixing itself to the bottom of the boat. So if you own one boat, not the end of the world. Take it to the end of the boat yard, scrape it off, and you're back in business. But imagine that same problem, scope and scale, at the size of a fleet of the US Navy. The Navy estimates that they spend over $1 billion annually in extra fuel and maintenance costs to help maintain clean hulls that get their ships moving efficiently from point A to point B. So they obviously have a vested interest in trying to solve this issue, which is why they contracted Dr. Tony Brennan from the University of Florida to come up with a solution. And Tony's first thought was, what animals in the ocean seem to naturally steer clear of this problem of biofouling? The short answer, of course, was sharks. His first guess was that maybe sharks are just speedier than those slower moving lumbering animals and that's what gives them the advantage but certainly he came to some quick conclusions that that wasn't the case because in examples like nurse sharks relatively sedentary slow moving sharks still maintain that clean body design so he got to thinking that it must have to do with the shark's skin so he got a hold of a shark and took an impression of its skin and then put that under a microscope. He studied what he saw there and then translated that sharky pattern into a synthetic wrap that's intended to be either applied to the hull of an existing boat or can actually be embedded into the hull of a brand new constructed boat. Either way, the net result is by simply imitating what a shark has been doing naturally for millions of years, we're able to bow that good idea and achieve great new things. And imagine, not just for the Navy, but about 90% of all goods that are shipped internationally have spent a fair amount of time on a container ship between China and Long Beach, China and Oakland. Tremendous amounts of fuel savings, which means more money in our pockets, but also less carbon being put into the atmosphere. So it's a win, win, win. Another fun story of efficiency comes from the bird world. This is a kingfisher, and this is actually a mama kingfisher. She needs to be efficient because during the course of a typical day, if she has a nest full of hungry chicks, she's got to fill their bellies with anywhere from 60 to 80 minnows per day. So she better be good at what she's doing. And one of the ways she's successful as a huntress is that she has this remarkably long beak relative to her body size. And that, in turn, gives her the ability to sneak up or surprise the animals she's going after because that long beak allows her to pierce the water surface while barely making a splash. Well, this idea that you could leave a less dense medium, air, and go into a more dense medium, water, without making a splash, got someone from Japan named Eiji Nikatsu thinking that this might help him solve a design challenge that the bullet trains of Japan were causing. Eiji was one of the original designers of the bullet trains in the late 1960s, and overall a great boon to Japanese society, getting people from point A to point B in quick fashion. But there's one key flaw with the original design. As they would speed across the countryside at 180 miles an hour and enter into a tunnel out in the Japanese countryside, Shortly before exiting the other side, a loud sonic boom would emerge, shaking nearby buildings and scaring the animals and the peoples of the countryside of Japan. So here's the old style bullet train you can see here, very aptly named, and we'll get to this one in just a moment. In his personal life, A.G. happened to be an avid birder, so he knew about the kingfisher and thought that that beak might prove really fruitful as the basis for a redesign of a new bullet train that would solve this problem. And when it went into production, not only did it solve the problem of the sonic boom, this train traveled 10% faster while using 15% less energy in the process. So you can see time and time again, nature's been doing R&D on these designs for millions of years. We can borrow and take advantage of some of that beta testing to do things better and more efficiently ourselves. Now let me turn the tables on you all and give you a challenge. Let's say I was going to ask you to design a a highly aerodynamic or efficient car, and I gave you two choices, and I said, I want you to base it on an animal from the ocean. Do you think that a more aerodynamic car shape would be better to be chosen with the shape of a shark or the shape of a tuna? What do you think? Call it out. Just what do you think? Okay, most people are saying tuna. All right, three choices. Now, shark, tuna, or boxfish? Go ahead and say boxfish. It's okay. You read the little thing, the blur beforehand. That's great. 
Well, this is actually pretty, uh, so this is a really surprising discovery that boxfishes in a wind tunnel test out to be more aerodynamic than just about any other critter ever tried. And I know that sounds very strange and counterintuitive. That discovery was really made by accident by a gentleman named Dieter Gertler. He works for a German car company, and he was tasked by his bosses with trying to come up with the most aerodynamic car ever built. And so he thought, what better place to look to than nature for inspiration? So he took a field trip down to the Stuttgart Museum of Natural History and asked to borrow some specimens from the curators. And they gave him the sort of typical things you might expect, sort of torpedo shape or, or uh, you know, uh, the penguins and tunas, but they also included a boxfish. And when they first saw this, they laughed, the, the people, the designers of the car. But when they, when they tested it in the wind tunnel, they were so astounded that it, like I say earlier, tested so beautifully that they got busy right away trying to understand what were the aspects of the body's design that were yielding these remarkable performance numbers in the wind tunnel. They took what they learned and translated that into a prototype car that they call affectionately the boxfish car. And this little thing gets 84 miles to the gallon. It's not an electric car, it's not a hybrid, it simply has a terrific shape that allows it to basically sip fuel compared to most cars on the road today. Many of you might have heard recently they've just said that by the year 2025, the average car in the United States has to get 54 miles to the gallon. Alan, this one's already getting 84 and it's a few years old. So maybe that is an achievable goal. I have saved, though, my favorite inventors for last. I think it'll go over well in this crowd given where we are. Anyone recognize these folks right here? Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir standing, of course, in beautiful Yosemite National Park. And what did they invent? The National Park System. Pretty good idea. I know their motivation for doing so was to make sure that future generations would have a beautiful place to fish and hike and camp and all those things we love to do in our national parks. But what they didn't realize was that their foresight has given us today just about the most proven tool or technology to help manage the overabundance of carbon pollution that's a necessary byproduct of how we get energy today. So as we look to the future, to look to cleaner sources of energy. In the meantime, these things are eating carbon for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and giving us oxygen in return. So it's a pretty good deal on our end if we just have the foresight to recognize the value that these ecosystems are providing our society today. So the good news is it's not just up to wetlands and forests to handle this problem. In fact, people all over the country are taking steps right now to make a difference in how we consume and generate electricity. In Greensburg, Kansas, 100% of their energy comes from the wind. Uh, in Mountain View, California, a 13-acre business campus covered themselves in solar panels to get some of the energy they need. In Denver and other cities across the country, bike sharing programs are popping up all over to help folks get around without using a car. Uh, along the banks of the East River, they're harnessing the power of the passing water to generate electricity. In Phoenix, Arizona, they've incentivized homeowners to go solar in part to help create jobs. In Fort Collins, Colorado, they're brewing beer with the power of wind. In Chicago, Illinois, they're planting green rooftops to help cool and warm buildings naturally while using less energy in the process. And a very cool story from closer to my neck of the woods in Palo Alto, California, an electric car manufacturer has partnered with the world's largest auto manufacturer to mass produce a five passenger electric sedan that gets 300 miles on a single charge being built in California and going on sale in early 2012. So, Great stuff right there, and if you gave me another hour, I could probably give you another hundred examples and fill this map with, with even more stories. It's a great start, but it's my belief that we're really serious about the need to pass along to the next generation a clean and healthy ocean, that we need to get really serious about thinking about how we generate and consume energy in this country. Because it's kind of poetic to think that the very animals that could be harmed by a more acidic ocean can also point us in new directions about how to get a cleaner, more sustainable energy future by looking to their, their designs for inspiration. Thank you very much.